Okay, hello everyone and uh, welcome to this last session of the um, conference. Okay, so um, we have three talks for this final session and um, our first talk is Unveiling the Unhidden, Applying Western Style Crime Survey Approach to Eastern Europe. And we have Dan Ignatons and Ludmilla Alexeva. I hope I said that right. Um, so I've just got some information about them to read out and then they can start. So um, Dan is the senior lecturer in criminology at the University of Huddersfield and um, uh, in economics at um, Dorgasville um, Un University, uh, Latvia. Um, his main research interests are quantitative criminology, immigration, repeat victimization patterns and crime seriousness judgments. Dan has been asked to present his research at a number of invited seminars and sessions at the Home Office, Neighbourhood Watch and other organisations as in the UK as well as at international events. And in his spare time, Dan is an avid martial arts practitioner and proponents of healthy lifestyle. And Ludmila is a doctor in economics, associate professor and head of department of economics at Dorgavsville University in Latvia. And her main directions of um, research are regional economics, smart growth, social and economic aspects of multi-helix. And since 2016, she has been an expert at Latvian Council of Science and Economics. She has more than 40 publications, two monographs, and has participated in 10 projects, including the ESF, Erasmus, and Appian National Research Programs. Okay, so it's time to go over to Dan and Ludmila. Thank you very much. I will start sharing my screen in a second. Um, I believe that has worked. Could anybody confirm that I've succeeded at that? Yes, that works. Well, that's already a success. Yes, thank you very much for having myself and Ludmilla here today. I've been a, a very big fan of this conference. As some of you will know, I've tried to present every single year for, I believe, the last eight years, with the exception of last year. So uh, it's great to be back, even though we are in an online environment. But uh, it's better than it's better than no environment, isn't it? Um, what we are presenting today is a paper associated with a research grant provided by Doug of Pulse University. And just a little bit of background: I was working on a sabbatical uh, in Doug of Pulse University just this year uh, in the Department of Economics with Ludmilla here, and uh, the article which is being published from this, and of course this conference paper. They stem way beyond just the use of surveys. They stem way beyond what the data shows here. And I've kind of split this presentation really into two things. There's the data implications, which we will discuss, of course. And then there's the bigger theoretical implications. So uh, at some points, if you do lose me a little bit, because I've been relatively creative with this one, don't worry about it, because it will all make sense at the end, hopefully. So. Um, Unveiling the unhidden, that's how we called this paper, and really the idea is that we know so much which is true, and yet sometimes we just sort of prefer not to look there, or we pretend like we shouldn't. And uh, we sort of start uh, quite easily, actually, with the Tower of Babel and the biblical story about that. I won't tell you the whole story because I only have 20 minutes to do this and I have to run away right after this presentation. But the idea in this story was that humans very much were able to progress quite far while they kept the same language, while they kept speaking in the same language and understanding each other. So the presupposition here is that when we don't speak the same language, and it doesn't have to be like a linguistic language as well, it can be simply a matter of categorizing things, then of course we don't understand each other and we can't benefit from each other's knowledge. And that's exactly what's happening, unfortunately, in much of criminology. In fact, I will even discuss whether criminology is really criminology. That's how creative I've been. But uh, let's start very easily. So I looked for one of the, well, I looked for basically an old Russian proverb and I found one. And it basically says, where's the duck? There's a ditch. And if you're an English speaker, and um, I, I'm assuming most of you will be English speakers as opposed to Russian speakers here, 
think just in your hearts and minds right now is there um do you understand it do you understand what that proverb means and probably most of you do probably most of you will say that it sounds a little bit like there's no fire without smoke or something of the sort right and that's the fun part about it with the translation software available to us and google translate is one of the big things which another article is actually being written on right now we should be able to convey the meaning of and across the languages in criminology and in other social sciences as well quite well while keeping the original intention so if we can understand a russian proverb from the 15th century while never having spoken russian and i'm assuming that's the case for most of us maybe that's maybe we can move past that problem maybe we genuinely are speaking the same language after all so uh on the language part, we can discuss things like the superior worth hypothesis and the idea that obviously the strong and hard version of the hypothesis is that we fully categorize things differently based on the language we speak. And the soft version is that we simply adjust the understanding based on the language which we use, the ideas of linguistic relativity, and overall our progress associated with that. We sometimes think that sort of we are on board with basic things in criminology. We sometimes like to believe that certain concepts just make sense. We all think crime is bad. We all think that offenders shouldn't be just punished for the sake of punishment. We think that all of that makes sense. Then again, we also think, based on majority of publications, that people fear crime. And I've published articles which say that people don't fear crime, they're angry about it. And we also think that crime harm is relatively understandable and simple enough because most Western countries now use it. And yet I've published papers on that as well, explaining how many of those judgments of harm and seriousness aren't actually measuring harm and seriousness. So the problem really is whether our progress is hindered by the language separation and social sciences which we have. And it certainly is exacerbated by the Anglo-centric nature of social sciences publications and journals and research in general. Simple example will be majority of European slash international academic journals. They all accept publications. Well, not all of them. Okay, a couple of them don't. But uh, most of them accept publications entirely in English. And in the guidelines for the authors, it says very clearly, if you can't write in English well, get help and only submit after that. So um, it's quite interesting to see journals which are called European journals. And there's more than one language in Europe and international journals. And there's more than one language internationally, which accept articles entirely in English. And there's no leeway about it as well. So, of course, articles can be denied for, for use of bad language english language not any other language so here's where we stem into the actual field of criminology and um while working in latvia i was looking i was trying to actually get a job in criminology because i'm a criminologist as many of us here are and i found myself explaining a lot to people what actually is criminology because criminology doesn't really exist in latvia and that's uh that was an interesting thing to encounter. How come I have a European PhD in a discipline which I got in Europe, which actually requires a lot of explanation. And again, and here we have that linguistic difference. So in much of Latvian and Russian um, literature as well, we have these two concepts. We have criminology, criminologia, and we have criminalistica almost, criminalistica. And they are two different things. One of them, the theoretical part, the criminology part, is sort of a theoretical science looking at the regular things which criminology looks at. And it's usually viewed as a Western concept. In many European countries altogether, there's no such course as criminology. Latvia is one of them. There's no such course. There's modules. There's lessons and kind of lectures on it but there is no course as such in criminology, there's criminalistica, which is a practical science, basically combination of crime science slash forensic science slash penology. And I found myself explaining to people quite often, well, what is actually criminology? And that really baffled me because if we assume 
which we do, but there are so many things in criminology which we all have in common and we all understand as the baseline principles for us to succeed at fighting crime. And yet even in Europe, sometimes we don't even have a clue what criminology is. That's, it's really quite baffling to be fair. So what's the necessary solution? The necessary solution is ability to facilitate information exchange. There's a lot of things which, of course, we do in Western countries, which Eastern countries could borrow, and not just Eastern countries. There's plenty of countries in the West which don't utilize things like victimization surveys. It's sensitization to data applicability. As we will show in this presentation, many, if not most, findings which we can take from British Crime Survey or Crime Survey for England and Wales can actually be found exactly, almost exactly, in the same manner in Latvia, which by no means is a Western country, not in this perspective. The basic principles and basic policy issues, they can actually be extended into other countries quite easily. It's not a matter of criminology being a Western discipline at all. In fact, much and most of what was found is just about that. And in many cases, it's not about looking the other way intentionally. And there is a need for this criminological Ignace Semmelweis in, in Eastern Europe, and uh, hopefully with a better with a better result for the actual person who takes that role, however. So uh, victimization surveys. We are here in Crime Surveys User Conference, which is exactly about that. And of course, we all largely agree that victimization surveys are a good thing. Mm, they are common practice in the West, uh, ICVS, uh, Crime Survey for England and Wales, and it's plenty of equivalents which are now used all across the world, including the local victimization surveys. They are emerging across the rest of the world, but again, it's the Western world and it's the English speaking world. It's not the rest of the world as such. And this function very often is fulfilled in other countries by completely different things, different random websites and online tests. But we all agree that they're good. So here's a little example, which I found about Latvia, which sort of looks like crime perception survey. It's a random website. It's not hosted by Latvia. It has no relevance to Latvia, but it's sort of fulfilling that function. And we see that in its lifetime, it's had 475 participants, which, well, that's not a lot for a whole country. And it has these sort of, you know, typical regular questions. So Problem is, we don't have a victimization survey in much of the Eastern uh, European countries, and certainly we don't in Latvia, where much of this research has been carried out. So the research which we're about to present very quickly comes from Latvia, from Latgala region, which is roughly your eastern uh, part of Latvia, and mostly Daugavpils, which is the city I was born in. It's the city I really love. And um, the survey was carried out in three years, 2018 and 19 in person and 2020 online, but it was the same survey carried out. We had a total sample of 322 participants and pretty much all surveys were almost fully completed, very, very few missing values. The ethnic sample was as described on the slide and just over two thirds of the people had Latvian citizenship. We looked for four little simple things just to test out if we emulate CSEW in an Eastern European country without amending it much. The whole point was not to amend it much. The point wasn't to specify culturally a lot of things. The point was to keep it largely as it is. Will we find the same stuff? And we looked at four basic concepts which have been analyzed extensively using uh, victimization surveys in general. So the first concept, unequal distribution of crime. We know using plenty of victimization surveys that crime is an unequally distributed, victimization specifically, but crime as well. We know that victim characteristics have remained roughly the same in the UK as well as in the Western world in the last 20, 30 years. Let's try to see what happens in Latvia. So in here we have displayed in the top 30% of our population how much victimization they experience. And we see that just 1% of Latvian population experiences pretty much a third of all vehicle victimization and sort of roughly 15% of the rest. 
which already says that just 1% of people experience a huge proportion of victimization. If we look at top decile, of course, that top decile experience is way more than anybody else, because once you move past the point of 90, everything else looks roughly, roughly the same. So again, top decile of population experiences a huge proportion of crime, same as uh, in the West. Then we look at average numbers of victimizations, and these average numbers are really huge. The one thing which we know about the West is even though the victimization is unequally distributed, the average number is dropping. Well, in Latvia, the average numbers of victimization are roughly like that. So we have numbers of 50 for vehicles in top percentile, and we have numbers of roughly 70 eight for total victimization in top percentile. Those are not low numbers. For the West, top percentile numbers were roughly three for vehicle and roughly seven for total. So we are speaking tenfold the victimization reported for the top percentile. Now, sure, you might say top percentile isn't very representative. Okay, but top decile will still be huge compared to everything else. So if we average out these numbers, we still see that it's nowhere near the second or the third decile. So the problem remains, but is just actually even worse in Latvia than in the West. How about victim characteristics? Again, your typical characteristics are here on the left and significance levels associated with victimization. Vehicle related, property related, personal related, total related. Again, the victim characteristics of the typical repeat victims are exactly the same in Latvia as they are in the West with a couple tiny amendments, so I could speak about them, but I don't have the time. I'm well aware that I have less than 10 minutes left. So point is, the points are exactly the same. In Latvia, victimization is unequally distributed. There's a huge proportion of victimization attributed to one percentile, let alone one decile, and we know who the victims are. Second point, crime seriousness and the victim. We know that victimization by repeat victims is perceived as more serious, we know that ethnic minorities perceive victimization as more serious than the natives. I've published on that. The references are available. So what about in Latvia? If we look at just the distribution of seriousness scores from 1 to 20, which is exactly how CSEW does it as well, we see that majority of all types of crimes besides for regular property crime are largely rated as 20s. In fact, the crimes rated mostly as 20s are vehicle-related crimes. So about 62% of vehicle-related victimization is rated as most serious. That is not the same as it is in the West. In the West, vehicle victimization is rated as least serious. So there is a cultural difference. However, if we do look at the top deciles again, all repeat victims, which form the top three most victimized deciles, they experience 15.7% of seriousness each, and they all have rated all of their victimizations as 20. So the point remains, people who are repeat victims, they rate their victimization more seriously, and there's a fair bit of them that needs working with. Point three, non-reporting to the police. We know that people who cooperate with police like it and who don't, don't like it. You need to cooperate with police first to have a good experience. And we know that ethnic minorities report victimization to police less, hence have less trust in them, hence cooperate with them less. What about Latvia? There are two things. I mean, there's a lot of things on the screen, and of course, feel free to look at them later once uh, I'm not limited by the very short time. I could speak about this for very long. I'm very passionate about this subject. But two things just to look at. If we split Latvian population by their ethnic identity in Latvians, Russians, and people who are of other ethnicities, we see that people who have cooperated with the police rate their experiences as roughly at a 10 out of 20. So we ask them, if you rate your cooperation with the police after reporting your victimization to them from 1 to 20, what would you give it? And they basically give it roughly a 9, 10, slash 8. But their expected scores, if they did cooperate for people who didn't, are actually super, super low. We see that, for example, for people identifying as Russian, if they did not work with the police, if they did not report a victimization to police, their expected score was 1.2. So they don't go to police because they think that's the worst experience they will ever have. 
Now, they don't know whether that's true or not. It's their expected score. And the ones who went actually enjoyed their cooperation. They got a 10 out of 20, which is kind of okay. But they expect it to be a 1. So that's an important point. And the second important point is the difference in reasons for non-reporting. If we look again at the ethnic belonging, we see that Latvian people don't report because they believe police couldn't help. So they're on the side of police. Whereas people of other ethnicities largely don't report because they think police doesn't care or they have other ways of dealing with it, which I'll mention again later on. I have to hurry up, I know. Point four, emotions experienced after victimization. We know that usually we're told that people are afraid of crime, but they're actually angry or annoyed. So um, if we look at the distribution of emotions after victimization, which we did analyze for this population as well, we see that it's not associated with whether they're a single or repeat victim or how seriously they rate their victimization. In most cases, they're angry. They're not afraid of it. However, if we split it by ethnic belonging, there's a huge difference. For Latvian ethnicity, people are mostly afraid of crime as opposed to angry about it. For Russian and other, they're mostly angry. Now, of course, a fight response means we speak about self-policing. Anger is a fight response. Disappointment, annoyance, there are fight responses. They mean self-policing. They mean not relying on somebody else. And fear and weakness are flight responses. They imply working with the police and reporting the victimization to them. So again, this point kind of explains the third. And that's our data conclusions. We know that victimization in Latvia is unequally distributed. We can identify the super victims quite easily. Seriousness ratings, again, they are much higher for repeat victims. So those two points work very well together, one with the other. Points three and four do as well. So ethnic and, and national groups, they are not represented in police in Latvia. You have to be a Latvian citizen to be represented in Latvian police forces. And the same groups are less likely to cooperate with the police, less likely to have trust in the police, less likely to uh, work with them, and more likely to find their own ways to fight crime, which is directly associated with the emotional response, which they have on the point as well. Thankfully, my final slide, but most important slide, theoretical conclusions. Why did I speak about the Bible and everything else before that? Because I think, and I strongly believe in this, that we need to integrate the rest of the world in criminological scholarship, specifically criminological scholarship. And the only way we're going to do that is by stemming beyond the differences in language, which we assume to be so serious, which this research shows are not serious at all. We still do speak the same language because victimization is just as bad for anybody. For a British person, for a Latvian person, I'm sure the same applies to the rest. Um, stemming from that, stemming from this research, I mean, these are just preliminary findings. Sure, it's not a huge research, it's not a huge survey, but it shows that there's plenty we can learn from existing practices in the West, and I'm sure from existing practices in the East as well. We don't need to reinvent the bicycle. Victimization surveys are as they are. They work. I've given it a shot, I've tried it, and they worked. And the point is really also to unite this divide between criminalistica and criminology because if we think in the eastern countries that criminology is this western theoretical concept which we don't need and all we need is the practical solutions it's hard to have the practical solutions without understanding the bigger picture i did make it on time so these are my references and these are our contact details thank you everybody and i hope that was okay Yes, our next speaker is talking about testing the association between household profile and burglar alarm effectiveness, and this is Danielle Robinson. Uh, so Danielle is currently a PhD candidate at Nottingham Trent University after being awarded Vice Chancellor Scholarship. And prior to this, Danielle undertook her undergraduate degree and master's degree in criminology, graduating with first class honours and distinction respectively. And Danielle's research interests lie in the field of crime reduction with a special interest in burglary reduction. Um, so, hello everybody. Um, my name is Danielle Robinson and I'm in the second year of my PhD studies. Um, this is some research that I've been working on with my supervisor, Professor Andrew Macchi-Saloni. Um, my PhD is entitled Understanding the Mechanisms of Situational Crime Prevention Initiatives and Measures. Um, and as part of 
my PhD, there will be a, a chapter that is dedicated to the association between household profile and burglar alarm effectiveness. And that is going to be the focus of my presentation today. Um, so just a quick overview then. I'm going to speak briefly about um, previous research in this field. Um, hopefully that will just help to justify and place the research that I'm working on currently. Um, I'll speak a bit about what I've done so far, um, the data that I've used, the approach that I've taken, um, look at some of the findings and obviously acknowledge some of the limitations within the data. Um, and then I'll speak a bit about where I plan to go with it and what I'm going to do next. Um, so I should just acknowledge here before I go on to speak about this research that there is an extensive body of literature which investigates security device effectiveness in relation to offender target selection, falls in burglary rates, effective security combinations and the context in which they're most effective. Um, and there, like I say, it's, it is extensive, but I'm going to just speak briefly now about some of that literature that actually utilises the crime survey data, just to keep it really relevant for this conference. So, um, Saloni et al. in 2014 and 17 carried out research into which security devices are most effective in the prevention of burglary. Um, and they found that some combina combinations were really effective and some were much less effective. Um, but it led them to develop the mnemonic WIDE, which is window locks, internal lights on a timer, double locks and deadlocks on external doors and external lights on a sensor. And that was found to be the most effective security device combination when taking value for money into account. <clears throat> In-depth in depth research into um, burglar alarms by Tilly et al. in 2015 found that the presence of a burglar alarm appears to increase the likelihood of burglary victimization. Um, so those findings were counterintuitive. Um, and he did state that the findings needed to be treated cautiously. And I know that there is um, there's been research in the field and that is ongoing. And this obviously um, fits in with that as well, this research that I'm going to speak about. Um, and most recently, um, research on burglar alarm impact in isolation and in combination with other security devices um, has been carried out by Saloni et al in 2021. And that was with the Home Office and College of Policing Safer Streets Fund Toolkit. Um, some of the findings that I'm going to be speaking about today are uh, my contribution to this research. And my, my research and this research is, is both ongoing. Um, so my main research question was, does the presence of a visible burglar alarm increase or decrease burglary victimization risk amongst various population groups? And um, so my real interest was, is there a higher or lower risk of, of, of any type of burglary? With, a, with particular groups of people. Um, in order to answer that question, um, I merged four sweeps of the crime survey for England and Wales from 2014 and 15 to 2017 and 18. Um, I used the non-victim form um, for, this first, for this first set of analysis the questions and the variables that I wanted to look at were all available in the non-victim form. And so I just used that to begin with, um, which gave me a sample of size across all four sweeps of 125,150. So when I was looking at choosing which, which questions I wanted to use and what I actually wanted to gain from, from this research, um, I thought that and um, the question, which of the following are visible at the sampled address, was a really good question. Um, it gives you a list of 10 security devices um, that, that, are, that, that you can look for. But I was interested specifically in whether or not there was a visible burglar alarm on the property. Um, it's worth mentioning here that this was not a participant question. This was actually on the electronic contact sheet for the interviewer. Um, and this was actually aimed at the interviewer. Um, so it asks them whether they see a burglar alarm on the approach or when they get to the property. 
I thought that was appropriate because if the interviewer can easily see that there's alarm that is visible, then it stands to reason that a potential burglar would also see that alarm. And this will help us answer how burglar alarm effectiveness might differ across population groups. So I'll speak a bit about the findings now. Some of these findings were really interesting. Um, so before I go on to speak about the findings, um, this is a comprehensive list of the household characteristics that I analysed. Um, you can see here that there is quite a quite a big list of, of different of different characteristics that was looked at. Um, I chose to look at the household representative person for the individual characteristics because I thought that um, you know they, they're usually the head of the household. They they earn the they usually have the biggest income, or if it matches, they they are the oldest. So they they tend to have a bigger influence on those wider characteristics of tenure and accommodation type due to you know they've usually got the highest income and that so I thought it was appropriate to use the household representative person um, and I should just make a note here that the the following findings these are I'm only sharing today the the results only results that show where risk is higher with the presence of a visible alarm than without across these different characteristics so how was it calculated? Um, for this data analysis, I simply did odds ratio of risk of burglary victimization for the given population group with a visible alarm compared to without one. So if we were going to use males as an example here, you, would, you could get the result that males are 1.5 times more likely to experience attempted burglary with a visible alarm than males without a visible alarm. So there's no comparison within those different um, population groups. It is just within that group. So males with an alarm or without an alarm. So this is my um, first set of findings. And um, so this is odds ratio against burglary victimization risk with a visible burglar alarm compared to without one across individual characteristics and wider household composition. Um, this the, the bars that are that are solid pink, they are the ones that are statistically significant. And the patterned bars, they are, they are findings that I still found interesting, but they weren't statistically significant. And um, you can see here that all of these characteristics did show an increased likelihood of burglary um, with a visible alarm than without, than without one across these characteristics. Um, but the headlines here would be um, that Asians are 50% more likely to be burglar, burgled with a visible alarm than Asians without one at 1 1.5 times. Um, you've got both owners and private renters show a higher risk of burglary with a visible alarm. They both had a 1.5 times more likely than those in the corresponding categories with a visible alarm than without one. And the same again for Categories eight, nine and 10 of the index of multiple, multiple deprivation, income deprivation, they all have a significantly higher chance, um, that which is 1.6 and 1.5 respectively. Um, and it's worth noting here that that obviously then includes the, um, the least deprived 10% of the population that have quite a significantly higher risk. Um, and it's interesting because there is there is um, research that, that um, backs some of this up or, or seems to correspond with this. So um, you can see that um, adult, two or more adults on here. So research by Saloni and Thompson in 2018 um, found that adult two uh, households with um, more than two adults or, or specifically shared households made like um, shared accommodation and, and places like that they um, did show an increased risk of burglary victimization um, and that it was likely due to the fact that there was um, more devices in the house. So there'd be um, there, there'd likely to be multiple phones, multiple laptops and things like that. Um, and they also found that households with children also had heightened risk by almost 50%, but after 1996, um, and you can see here that 
households with children here, they, they have a heightened risk, although it wasn't statistically significant in this case. Um, and lone parent households had a heightened risk of 75% um, in Saloni and Thompson's findings. Um, and again, that was the same as this, but it wasn't statistically significant, but still, you know, really interesting findings. So this here is exactly the same, but this is with attempted burglary victimization risk with a visible burglar alarm compared to without one across the individual characteristics and wider household compositions. Um, there were definitely less statistically significant findings with attempted burglary. Um, and there was less that sort of had any any risk either way. Um, but you can see here that the most heightened risk here is when you um, have lived in the address for one to two years. Um, and that shows a significantly heightened risk of 1.6 times more likely than those who have lived in their address for one to two years who do not have a visible alarm. Um, it's worth noting here as well that you can see that homeowners and private renters are both on this chart and on the previous one. Um, so although a lot of um, a lot of research actually shows that social renters do have a, are the most are the, are the most at risk um, type type of um, type of tenure that um, homeowners on private renters are both on this with quite a heightened risk um, for this for this research. So it was just worth noting that. It's definitely worth acknowledging some some limitations or, or caveats um, for this research. Um, this obviously doesn't tell us if the burglar alarm was installed at the time of the first experience of burglary victimization or if it was installed as a consequence of the victimization. Um, I just want to point out at this point that where I said earlier that um, this these findings were my contribution to the um, Saloni et al research in 2021, um, that the rest of the research absolutely does account for the existence of a burglary alarm, of a, sorry, of a burglar alarm um, and, when, and when it was installed. It is just my contribution that currently doesn't account for that um, and the rest of the research does account for that. Um, so because it doesn't, um, it doesn't show the true, true risk of, across the population types as burglar alarm might have been installed after the victimization. Um, so um, this is recorded at the time of the interview. So the interviewer goes and approaches the property, sees a burglar alarm, ticks that there is a burglar alarm, um, but they have absolutely no idea when that was installed. So they um, will then go and do the interview. And if the participant says, yes, they've been a victim of burglary, they will have, it shows that they have an alarm and that they've been a victim of burglary, but they may have had that installed after their victimization. So there's obviously a limitation there um, uh, that needs addressing um, because it is quite important that it is quite an important piece of knowledge that we need to, that we need to know. Um, so obviously this um, research is in its infancy um, and this is really just a preliminary indication of burglar alarm effectiveness across population groups. However, I think, I'm biased, but I think these um, findings are really interesting. And with that in mind, moving forward, um, firstly and foremost, I really think that, um, you know, the most pressing issue here is that we need to find out when the burglar alarm was installed and whether it was before or after the victimization. And that is the first problem that I um, attend to address. And that will involve merging the non-victim form with the victim form. So all of that really good information that I've already got from the non-victim form I'll keep and I'll merge it with the victim form, um, which has all of the information about when the burglar alarm was installed. Um, I'm also going to add an extra two sweeps to take it up to 2020. So then it will be across the six sweeps. Um, and I will analyze all the security combinations, all of the possible combinations that include a burglar alarm. So any combination from all of the different um, security devices that there could be that are available in the crime survey, um, all of those possible combinations will need to be looked at individually. So as you can see, this is quite a time consuming um, process, which will be the merging of the victim and non-victim form across those sweeps and then analysing the possible combinations is all quite time consuming. 
And quite honestly, time is the only reason that this hasn't been done up until this point, just with different PhD responsibilities and, th and things like that. I also intend to add a qualitative aspect to this, um, which will involve um, interviews in the newly refurbished St Anne's neighbourhood in Nottingham. Um, and it will look at the impact of the refurbishment in the area. So it will be semi-structured interviews um, hopefully with community agents um, new, new, at the newly refurbished neighbourhood. Um, I'll be interviewing neighbourhood WAP representatives, um, local victim support re representatives, which can obviously offer insight into um, the types of population groups that approach them for, for, for help. Um, PCSOs. Um, I also have access to interview the architect for Nottingham City Council, who has designed the refurb. Um, and I will be interviewing various um, people who actually live on the estate as well. Um, and I'll be asking them about not only about how they think burglar alarms are, whether they think they're effective and, and whether they think make them feel safe, but also about social cohesion. And um, so this will feed into my wider PhD project as well. And, and whether, you know, area type and, and area context also affects the impact of burglar alarms. Um, so this will really combine burglar alarm impact with individual feelings of safety in context with social cohesion and the impact of burglar alarms in the St Anne's neighbourhood. And when that is all done, I am hoping that we will have a much deeper understanding of which population groups have an increased or decreased risk of burglary or attempted burglary or not. Thank you for listening. Any questions? So um, this is a talk about when do businesses report cybercrime findings from a UK study. And our speaker is Dr. Stephen Kemp, who is a postdoctoral researcher in criminology at Pompe Fabra University in Barcelona in Spain. And he's previously collaborated with the criminology department at the University of Manchester, as well as several Spanish universities. And his main lines of research focus on cybercrime, fraud, crime reporting and sentencing. OK, perfect. So, yeah, thank you very much for the, the introduction, Sarah. And also thank you more generally to the to the organisers from the perspective of a participant. It all, it's all gone very smoothly. Um, also, um, the, the idea of the, of the conference is something that's really interesting. In Spain, we don't have anything uh, similar. So it's definitely something that uh, we might be looking to, to copy in the future. Uh, so I'm going to be presenting, uh, I'm going to be presenting a paper that is out to, uh, due to come out soon, which is titled When Do Businesses Report Cybercrime? Findings from a UK Study. This has been offered by myself, uh, together with David Bouliguil from the University of Manchester, Fernando Miro Linares from Miguel and uh, University in Elche, Spain, and also uh, with Nicholas Lord from the University of Manchester. So uh, just to give you a little bit of context to begin with. Um, as many of us are aware, uh, cybercrime poses a, a growing threat to, to organizations in the United Kingdom and in Spain and, and around the world. Uh, we found in a previous study that we published a few months ago that there were quite steep rises in certain types of cyber-enabled fraud against organizations at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, that kind of ties into um, some of the uh, some of the one of the presentations earlier on, on data from Crime Survey uh, for England and Wales uh, regarding individuals. Also, we Action Fraud publishes data on the losses that have been reported by organisations, and we find that in the last twelve months, the losses are approximately five hundred million pounds, so very very high uh, amounts of losses. And importantly, um, cybercrime is not something that only affects large organisations small and medium-sized organizations also have um, relatively high probability of suffering uh, cyber incidents. And in any case, it's also worth noting that even when um, these incidents affect larger organizations that might have uh, more resources to, to, to mitigate the impacts, a lot of the times they're not going to be assuming the cost of the breach, but these costs are going to be passed on to, to, to customers. So uh, it's really, in the end, something that that affects everybody. So, so that's the main context of, of rising, uh, rising threat uh, 
having cyber crime against organizations. And in this context, it's quite surprising that there's very little research, certainly from, from the social sciences, I'm, I'm, I'm a criminologist, and there's very, very little research on cyber crime against organizations. And this has been put down to the fact that there's generally a, a lack of data, which is related to uh, low, low levels of reporting. Now, th this is problematic because reporting is, is key for the prevention and, and responses. Now, if we want to understand the most pertinent threats uh, at the moment, and we want to design strategies to, to try and mitigate those threats, and we want to evaluate those strategies, then reporting is really, really important. So uh, on that basis, what we, what we wanted to do, or what we wanted to do here in this paper is basically understand reporting a little bit better with hopefully with the aim of being able to improve reporting processes and then get better data okay so it's quite an, ex an exploratory study um, so what do we know about crime reporting by businesses more and more generally because like i said there's not really very much about cyber crime reporting there's a little bit more about crime reporting uh, against businesses more generally um, the, the existing research has found that crime reporting by businesses can by, be predicted by certain factors. Okay, For example, it can be predicted by the type of crime, and it can be predicted by the impact. The, the greater impact is associated with higher levels of reporting. The characteristics of the organization can be relevant, and particularly relevant is the perceived efficacy of, of reporting, if um, reporting is believed to um, be able to produce some kind of benefit. Okay. Like I said, there's very little research on cyber crime reporting by businesses. There are a couple of, of surveys and, and one book chapter published. Um, and what they find is that in general, there's uh, lower reporting by businesses to police rather than, than non-police organizations. Um, the reporting can depend on the ability of the organization to uh, resolve the incident internally rather than reporting it. The impact is relevant with regard to cybercrime. Insurance can be relevant uh, in the sense that sometimes reporting is necessary to be able to, to, to file an uh, insurance claim. And we find that the issues regarding reputation are particularly relevant with, with businesses and, and organizations, that there may be um, a little bit of a reticence to, to report. Um, organizations or businesses don't want to be associated with security breaches, with loss of customers' data, uh, with loss of, of money and uh, not being able to protect their customers. So reputation is something that is, is relevant to, to reporting as well. So what we look to do in, in, in this paper, what we were aiming to do was to uh, answer three research questions. Uh, firstly, to whether the, the, characteristics, is the characteristics of businesses, uh, for example, the size, the sector, the digital activity of businesses, were associated with cyber crime reporting. Secondly, uh, to see whether the attitudes of businesses towards cybersecurity and their cybersecurity practices uh, were associated with cyber crime reporting. And finally, uh, we wanted to analyze whether the characteristics of the cyber crime event or the cyber incident were associated with reporting. So as you can see, it's, it's uh, quite an exp uh, exploratory study, uh, basically because there isn't a lot of, of research already existing. So to, uh, to answer these questions, we obtained data from the cybersecurity breaches survey. Um, we uh, obtained the data from three waves of the survey from uh, 2018, 2019, and 2020, which uh, gave us a sample of approximately 4,500 businesses in the UK. Uh, in this survey, they used disproportionate sampling. So when we merged uh, the three waves of the the survey, we then uh, re-weighted the sample again so that it was representative of UK businesses in terms of size and sector. And then we filtered this sample uh, to obtain a, a subsample of those companies that said that they had suffered uh, at least one incident in the previous 12 months. So that's approximately 12,000 UK businesses. And we're looking at two types of reporting. We're interested in two types of reporting. On the one hand, reporting to the police and other public authorities. And on the other hand, reporting to any external organization, because obviously uh, businesses can report cybersecurity incidents to uh, 
cybersecurity providers, to the bank, to internet service providers, to clients, to customers, as well as uh, public organizations like the police or the national cybersecurity. So just to give you a quick uh, descriptive overview of, of, of some of the most important uh, elements, the typical incidents that uh, companies were suffering, uh, in, in first place, the most common incident was, was, was phishing attacks. Uh, there were 34.5% of the weighted samples said that they suffered uh, these types of incidents. Then in second place, uh, people impersonating organizations and emails uh, all online, uh, in the form of identity uh, theft. In third and fourth place, we have uh, incidents related to malware, uh, viruses, or, or ransomware. Then in fifth place, uh, incidents related to hackers from external uh, actors, followed by uh, DDoS attacks, which was 3.4%. And finally, uh, hacking of online bank accounts, which was reported by 3.3% of the weighted sample. And then import importantly, we look at the, the, the results or the data for the reporting rates for the most serious incidents. So a number of organizations would obviously uh, suffer multiple incidents. And then in the survey, they ask them about reporting the most serious incident that they suffered. So we find quite a, a contrast here. Um, in, on the one hand, 39.5% of the weighted sample reported the incident the most serious incident to someone external in the organization, but only 8% reported to a public authority. Okay, and we'll discuss a little bit the implications of this later on. With regards to, to our variables and, and, and our methods, um, the two dependent variables are, are, are as I've mentioned before, the whether they reported the incident to someone outside the organization and whether they reported it to a UK public authority. And then with the independent variables that we're looking at. Uh, characteristics of the, of the organizations of the businesses like size, sector, online activities, uh, whether they hold personal data about clients, whether they have an online payment system, they have an online bank account, uh, if their employees um, work from home. Then cybersecurity variables, for example, the, whether they consider cybersecurity a high priority, if cybersecurity is um, outsourced or whether it is managed internally whether they have some form of cybersecurity insurance, whether a specific policy or as part of a wider policy. Also, if the, if the businesses carry out some type of risk identification and whether they had sought government advice on cybersecurity issues. And then we looked at the crime type or the incident type and whether there was a negative impact from that, uh, which could be a loss of money, but it could also be a loss of working hours of, of employees to deal with the incident. Um, now, in the 2018 and 2019 waves of the survey, there were two uh, questions that we thought would be were interesting regarding whether the, the business considered that it was prepared to deal with cybersecurity issues and whether they um, carried out any type of training with their uh, employees. This wasn't included in the 2020 survey. So what we've actually done is we, we've uh, estimated four, uh, four binary logistic regression models. So what we've done is for each dependent variable, we've, we've estimated two, okay? Uh, for on the one hand, the, a model with all three waves of the, of the survey, and on the other hand, a model that only has the 2018 and 2019 waves, but includes these variables of preparedness and training. Okay, so for each dependent variable, there, there, are, there are two, uh, two models that we've looked at. With, regards to the results first of all uh, i wanted to talk about the results for reporting to somebody outside the organization okay so this is reporting to anyone outside the organization it could be uh, police national cyber security center but also financial institutions cyber security providers uh, etc so what we find is that the crime type is relevant as as we expected and as you would expect uh, phishing is reported less than other types of other types of incidents like hacking or, or uh, identity theft. The negative consequences are also relevant, as you would expect. When there are greater negative consequences, uh, reporting is more likely. We also found that uh, when businesses uh, consider cybersecurity to be a high priority, they are more likely to report incidents to someone outside the organization. And when they have an external cybersecurity management system, they're more likely to 
to report to somebody outside the organization is, is driven by the fact that they're, they're reporting to external cybersecurity providers and companies. In contrast, uh, those uh, organize, those businesses that uh, internalize their cybersecurity management reported less to somebody outside the organization. And interestingly, we, we found in one of the models evidence that those that uh, businesses that hold electronic data about customers were also less likely to report cybersecurity incidents to somewhere outside the organization. Now, with regards to reporting to the public authorities, we find some similarities and some differences that, that, that could be quite relevant. So we find similarities in the sense that the crime type uh, is relevant, phishing is reported less than other types of incidents, uh, the negative consequences increase the likelihood of reporting, as does considering cybersecurity a high priority. Uh, but in this case, we find that those businesses with internal cybersecurity uh, management are more likely to report to public authorities, which contrasts with what we found regarding reporting to anyone outside the organization. And then we also found some weak evidence that uh, those organizations that allow their employees to use personal devices for work tasks were less likely to report cybersecurity incidents to public authorities. So I wanted to, to just finish by talking about the, the implications of, of, these, uh, of these findings. So um, regarding research question one, we find limited evidence that the characteristics of businesses are associated with cybercrime reporting, um, but there's some preliminary associations with regard to some activities, such as holding customer information electronically or mobile working. And the question of mobile working is, I think particularly interesting in, in terms of um, in terms of companies and the guardians of companies insurance system, their companies information systems. Um, when performing work-related tasks on personal devices, who's considered the primary capable guardian? Who's responsible uh, for for reporting in the, in the era of teleworking? Regarding um, research question two on attitudes and practices. Uh, the association between considering cybersecurity a high priority and reporting could be related to the perceived benefits of reporting in terms of making society in general more, more cyber secure. And then um, the questions of the differences between external and internal cybersecurity management structures, I'm going to come back to them in just a moment. And finally, regarding research question two, the cybercrime event is related to reporting and ever the negative impact and the crime type are significant. Uh, I think it's important to mention here mandatory reporting, uh, what types of crime and impact generate mandatory, mandatory reporting, uh, because one would imagine that that's very important to the reporting decision. Uh, future research could analyze the, dy the dynamics created by mandatory reporting and, and its effectiveness. So just to finish up, uh, the key takeaways in the discussion, I think our findings generate discussion regarding, uh, above all, the role of private cybersecurity companies and the criminal justice system in the prevention of cybercrime. Uh, only 8% of the most disruptive incidents suffered by businesses were reported to public authorities, while 39.5% were reported to someone outside the organization. Uh, this ties in with previous research and it could indicate that private entities prefer a private model of cybercrime control regarding cybercrime. Uh, low levels of reporting to public authorities could be the result of uh, a lack of uh, of confidence in the capacity of authorities to, to provide a suitable response, perceptions that attacks can be dealt with internally, concerns about potential reputational damage, or, or not wishing to share internet or business activity history with public authorities. So the, the, this disparity between reporting to public authorities and reporting to anyone outside the organization may exemplify the rise of private policing that has been documented with regard to cybercrime. And this links in with our results that point to businesses with outsourced cybersecurity management reporting more to organizations, but not to public authorities. Uh, could this be an indication that cybersecurity companies either directly or indirectly discourage reporting to public authorities due to a lack of confidence in their ability? Or is there potentially an economic interest in reducing the involvement of public authorities? Well, Cybersecurity industry is privatized, it's competitive, and this could discourage involving public authorities with more cybersecurity work and it's greater economic benefits. And then on the other hand, do in-house cybersecurity teams trust public authorities more? Are they less driven by a 
direct profit motive and thus more inclined to seek external public help. Um, I think these, these questions advocate for future research on the decision-making process with regard to reporting cybercrime and how this relates to organization security regime, regimes and how this relates to crime prevention and the role of criminal justice systems in the digital age. Uh, many thanks for listening. You have my contact details there.